You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. I have uh, Wynand De Beer. Uh, he's a multi- multi-time author. Um, we talk about metaphysics and um, various philosophies, Christian theology, uh, Greek philosophy, etc. cetera. Uh, he's got some really interesting thoughts on subjects I really don't cover very often. And I wanted to talk to him today about um, something he's discovered that uh, I guess is changing the course of his thoughts, which he'll get into. But Wynand, thank you for coming. How are you doing? Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, good to talk to you again. Yeah, uh, you, you were just starting to tell me about Albert Camus, but if you wouldn't mind, uh, you know, now that we, we're recording, can you repeat what you uh, just said to me? Yes, certainly. Uh, it was in the summer of 2017, uh, just over two years ago, that I read um, his uh, brilliant work in which he compares the metaphysics of uh, Neoplatonism and early Christianity, we're specifically referring to Plotinus and St. Augustine. And uh, it was such an inspiration to me, uh, having been a long time admirer of Camus, actually since the early 80s, uh, that it inspired me to uh, write down uh, some thoughts on, on a range of metaphysical issues. And as I began writing, the, the ideas just kept uh, flowing. And eventually it became a, a compendium, one could say, um, covering a wide range of issues, philosophical and theological and in, even socio-political in the final chapters, in which I use um, insights from uh, classical Greek philosophy and also early Christian theology, both Greek and Latin, um, also adding elements from uh, Indian philosophy uh, in the process um, to state certain uh, traditional positions on issues which uh, many people may be interested in, uh, but uh, m- much of that um, uh, mindset um, has been lost in the modern world through the rise of, uh, first of all, rationalism uh, and later also uh, secular humanism. And of course, in the current era, very much uh, atheism and materialism. Um, so I thought it would be a good idea to restate some of the traditional positions. And uh, all along, I wasn't really sure if it was really something uh, important or, or relevant that I was doing. Uh, I mean, they are much better thinkers than myself. Uh, I'm not at all an original thinker. I try to take things from others and put them together, um, which is, of course, a, a valid way of research. Uh, well, a sen- yeah, a synthesis of other ideas is, is new, so there's nothing wrong with that. Oh, <laughs> thank you. But I, when I received, the, or rather when the publisher and I received the, the endorsements from a number of scholars, uh, which has gone on to the back cover of the new book, I was ast- astonished. I, I couldn't believe it. I thought they must be uh, referring to someone else. So that was an enormous um, uh, boost to me and a motivation to, to continue writing. Um, well, what are the, um, so, I mean, again, this is an area I'm really not familiar with. So what are some of the, the thoughts that you've assembled and then what are new conclusions you've drawn? Um, would you mind if I uh, mention some of the, some of the chapter headings in the book? Uh, because oh, sure. that, yeah, we'll start with that. Uh, I've, I've tried to make the headings as uh, you know as, as clear and concise as possible to give an idea of precisely what the chapters are about, and uh, most of the chapter headings uh, come in pairs. Uh, so uh, 
for example, the first one after the, the historical background regarding the Indo-Europeans is called being and non-being. Uh, then the next one is metaphysical and physical, then mind and motion, then intellect and necessity, and then soul and matter, and concluding with levels of being. So that oh, basically the first part of the book covers uh, uh, traditional metaphysical uh, views. And then it goes over into, uh, one could almost say more everyday areas such as well-being and love is the one chapter, good and evil, truth and knowledge, time and eternity, death and immortality. Uh, and uh, then there's a chapter on consciousness, uh, we, something that we also touched upon in our previous conversation. Uh, and there I used that scheme by Raymond Bach on the three levels of consciousness, uh, which is simple consciousness and self-consciousness and cosmic consciousness. And I then discuss uh, three manifestations of this cosmic consciousness or higher consciousness, uh, namely uh, religion and mathematics and music, uh, all of whom I regard as manifestations of such a consciousness. And then the three concluding chapters deal with socio-political issues, which by the very nature of things uh, uh, could be contentious or uh, uh, could stir a bit. Um, and they are titled Man and Woman, Aristocracy and Democracy, and Freedom and Liberalism. So uh, it covers a uh, the book as a whole covers a fairly wide range of, of themes, I would think. All right. So for, for someone that, uh, you know, those just, I mean, they sound like uh, opposites and there's not much depth to each of them yet. Mm. But what are some, you know, we can't go through all of them, but uh, pick a few that really stand out to you and tell me what's new in your, in your synthesis of some of the ideas. Well, let's start with one which is uh, very much relevant in, in, uh, social discourse nowadays, uh, namely man and woman. So uh, taking the, the traditional view of uh, a gender uh, coming from Greek philosophy and uh, traditional Christian theology, for example, I uh, argue that uh, male and female are, uh, in fact, uh, polar opposites. Um, and uh, it should be accepted as such that we differ fundamentally and not only in terms of you know certain physiological functions, which is of course the the, the modern view that uh, that the man and woman are equal or not or not equal, they are identical in everything, except in in regard of certain uh, uh, physiological issues. But in the traditional understanding, the uh, the differences go much deeper, and it has to be that way um, because it has to do with the with the processes of life and the origins of life. Um, and male and female have even been related to the traditional Indo-European view of universal essence and universal substance, which in Sanskrit is called uh, Purusha and Prakriti, respectively. And um, so the two, the two uh, have to function as uh, polar opposites in order to constitute the reality that we live in. Um, and therefore, any attempt to, to deny these, these differences um, and to throw everyone into a, a, a total egalitarianism is, is just plainly wrong. Um, so on the one hand, I criticize a phenomenon such as uh, militant feminism, which is one of the features of our time, uh, which appears, for example, in much of the entertainment uh, world, in movies, um, in uh, music, um, in some literature, even in theology, when one finds uh, feminist theology. Um, but on the other hand, I conclude that chapter by saying that uh, both Feminism, or especially in its militant form uh, that we often encounter today, but perhaps more in the Western world than, than in the rest of the world, that both this modern uh, kind of feminism and the male chauvinism, which certainly was, was uh, a dominant for, for much of our history, um, should be rejected as, as wrong. Um, both of them entail an unbalanced view of gender because chauvin chauvinism views men as innately superior to women and uh, feminism views women as innately superior to men. And both of those should Yeah, be... I view them as, as both necessary parts of a whole. And without yes, one, the yes. other suffers and vice versa. That's right. So uh, I then conclude that uh, we, I agree with uh, many of the authors that I refer to that we differ fundamentally, although sharing the same human nature. In other words, in other words we may have different functions still, but we are absolutely equal in value. There's no question of... of subordination or anything like that, or domination, uh, which is how it's usually viewed whenever one speaks uh, along these lines. Well, how do you view, um, as you know, again, some people today are saying, oh, there's, there's 17 genders and 
you know, there's this ism and that ism. And I mean, I don't know, what, what's your view there? When people say there's, I, I didn't even know the name of all these supposed genders, but what, what are your views when people talk about that? What are they doing, do you think? No, I think, I think it's gone uh, overboard, Richard. Um, of course, we, we, uh, we can't condone certain things that happened in the past, you know, when, uh, say, people with, with different uh, preferences were, were uh, persecuted uh, and uh, uh, legally punished and things like that. You know, I certainly don't um, support that or uh, uh, call out for that. But I think the whole phenomenon has, um, phenomenon has gone overboard. You know, if you look, for example, at the, uh, the acronym, you know, for the, the same sex and transsex movement, uh, uh, I think LGBT plus or plus plus or plus plus plus. You know, every every year or so, there's another item added to the to the acronym. Uh, so it's gone overboard. It's become unbalanced um, and distorted, uh, which I view as inevitable because um, human nature tends to always, um, because of of our innate rebellion against God, which has been going on for countless millenniums, uh, we always tend to to take things to extremes. Um, especially when trying to correct something that, that, that could have been wrong in the past or probably was wrong, uh, people tend to go to other extremes. Uh, according to the old principle that the further a pendulum you know, swings to the one side, the, sw- the further it will swing back to the other side. So uh, uh, I'm afraid uh, much of this current modern Western phenomenon uh, regarding sexuality is uh, uh, unbalanced and over the top. And it's been taken to, to extremes unnecessarily. Well, I think maybe people are confusing sexuality with gender. They, they're sure there could be, you know, uh, I guess different kinds of sexuality, but there really only is two genders. Maybe yes, of, yes, of which someone so. that feels neither somehow. But Well, by and large, absolutely, yes. The, we, have, we have male and female, as we encounter throughout the animal kingdom. And of course, on the, on the physiological level, we are animals. Uh, there's no getting around that. Um, we we hope we we aim or we strive to be more than animals uh, on the on the spiritual level, uh, but physically we are very much animals. And uh, I think by disregarding uh, the laws of nature um, in the end uh, or in the long term, it always brings uh, disastrous results, whether to individuals or to society as a whole. Yeah, I agree. So what's a, what's another concept that another concept really, uh, in, 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 in the final. In the final chapter of the book, um, which is titled uh, Freedom and Liberalism, I, I look at the concept of freedom, how we have uh, traditionally been understood, with an emphasis being on um, freedom to, in other words, freedom to do something. Whereas in the viewpoint of, of liberalism, which is, of course, a modern political ideology, the emphasis is on freedom from. Now, of course, we all want to be free from, from oppression and tyranny and dictatorship and all these things. That, that stands to reason. But one, one doesn't really need a political ideology to tell you that. That's just common sense. You know, it's basic rationality, which has been around for thousands of years. Yeah. Uh, and then I show some of the manifestations of this um, ideology of liberalism uh, in, the, in the modern era. And also over the past two to three decades, it has become uh, distorted even further into what some writers call uh, called post-liberalism. Uh, some call it neoliberalism. And then there's, of course, also an ideology called neoconservatism, uh, which was born in America and Britain in the 1980s, in the Reagan and Thatcher era, um, but which is just another version, actually, of liberalism. Um, And uh, in the same vein, I then continue uh, by arguing that liberalism, uh, especially with with the apparent victory of liberalism over socialism, which occurred in the 1990s when the Soviet Union came to an end, and uh, before that, the Cold War ended. Uh, it was widely viewed as a vindication of Western-style uh, capitalism. And that's why uh, Fukuyama wrote that uh, famous book, uh, uh, The End of History and the Last Man, by saying that uh, the stage that the Western world had arrived at by the 1990s uh, was basically the, the final point of human evolution. Uh, but there are many different uh, ways of looking at that. Um, and I also argue that... Uh, the transitions that has taken place in the geopolitical world over the past century or so actually corresponds with certain uh, cosmological models. For example, in the Cold War era, from the end of the Second World War until the end of the Soviet era, uh, the world were had, or most of the world was situated in a bipolar world order, 
which was dominated by the American bloc on the one side and the Soviet bloc on the other side. And this corresponds to a, a dualistic cosmology, uh, as is found, for example, in Gnosticism, where there are two uh, principles with um, very little in common, if anything. And then with the ostensible victory of liberalism in the 1990s, which allied with capitalism, of course, uh, it became a, a unipolar world order, which the elites in uh, countries like America and Britain and France have been trying to enforce onto the whole world since that time. And this corresponds with a monistic cosmology, which says that uh, everything, there's only one, um, one reality and very little room for differentiation. And then I write in support of uh, a multipolar world order, that there should be various centers of civilization. And this was mentioned by uh, Samuel Huntington in his book, The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of World Order, uh, also dating from the 1990s, um, that instead of trying to enforce a single economic system and a single political system and a single value system onto the entire human population, um, it would be far better for everyone if we uh, recognize that there are different value systems and these are allied with different um, uh, religious beliefs and different philosophical beliefs. Um, and there's no reason in the world why they couldn't coexist uh, peacefully um, instead of trying to enforce a single system onto, onto everyone, uh, whether that system be uh, one, one of the isms uh, or another. And uh, there's such a multipolar world order would then also correlate with a cosmological model of uh, what I call a differentiated unity. In other words, with a supreme transcendent principle where everything begins and which is called different names in different spiritual traditions, uh, manifests mm -hmm. in almost infinite variety uh, and diversity on this uh, physical level in which we live. In other words, there is a, uh, a unity, but it's a unity in diversity. And also from our viewpoint, a diversity in unity. Well, as, you know, there's been multiple religions for quite a long time and they've functioned on their own and they've been okay and the world hasn't ended. So yeah, there's no need for instance, to have just one religion that everyone must adhere to just like there probably doesn't need to be one economic system that everyone has to adhere to or one philosophy or one set of values or one anything. But, uh, you know, the, the, I guess the sinister thing, and it's very sinister to me that I see nowadays, you know, especially in the U S is that under the, the words of an, you know, diversity and inclusivity and, you know, uh, fighting fascism and all that, the, the people that are, they try to ram it down other people's throats and prosecute them and beat them into, it's just weird. They, they're using these words to do the exact opposite of what they're proclaiming they want to do. Yes. And they're doing it in a really violent and nasty way. So it's just kind of ironic and very sinister that they're, they're using the exact same words that they're going against and everything they do to, to try to force this new order upon people. You know? That's right. That's right. Uh, yes, they are the, the, the neoliberals or the post-liberals, as some writers call them. Um, and they do these things in the name of freedom, of course, which, which makes it even more um, repre reprehensible, I would say. Um, they are often more intolerant than, than the fascists or the communists were in the 20th century uh, when it comes to silencing opposing viewpoints and things like that. <laughs> which is certainly not a, a way to go forward, you know, or a way to solve uh, problems or disputes. Uh, for that, some, things like dialogue um, is always uh, preferable to uh, silencing uh, opposing voices. Um, so that is certainly one of the major uh, threats in our time. Um, and it certainly seems to be the case in, in, in much of the Western world, in, in uh, Europe and North America. Uh, if it, how much it is in, in the rest of the world, um, I'm, I'm not uh, fully familiar with. But it is certainly a cause for concern, yes. And North Korea may be the new, cool, relaxed place to live at some point. I know that won't happen. I'm just <laughs> Well, I'm just, uh, I'm I'll, just, I'll, I'll be very glad if... Hopefully uh, it doesn't get that bad. Yes, although I, I would be glad if the two Koreas can be unified um, before I uh, uh, know uh, in or before I come to the end of this uh, existence. But perhaps that will just remain a dream. Uh, I think I think uh, many people would like to see uh, where uh, one nation has been divided along political lines or ideological lines uh, that that could uh, eventually be um, overcome. But that's uh, of course not uh, it's not in our remit. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, uh, maybe maybe one more concept that really sticks out at you. We'll go for three. Three is always a good uh, a good set of things to think about. We talked about gender perception of it. We talked about uh, you know these 
the oneness of a political ideology. And what's the third concept that you want to bring up from the book? I think something that might interest some some listeners is in the chapter where I discuss death and immortality. Um, of course, um, it's unfashionable in, in the modern culture to, to mention the word death, uh, let alone have a discussion about it. Uh, mm. it's, it's, it's viewed as not part of civilized discourse, while in reality, it's one of the most important things. You know, I, I'm certainly not saying we should talk about it all the time or think about it all the time. We all still have to get on with living. Uh, but it, it, that, that it should be pondered uh, when, when there's an opportunity and perhaps also as one grows older um, uh, is certainly, is certainly uh, important. Um, hence the old saying that only two things are certain, death and taxes. Um, so in this uh, particular chapter, I focus on, on, uh, on death, on uh, bodily death, the inevitability of it, um, the horror of it, but also the fact that it's not, not viewed as the end of, of, of all things. Uh, precisely because of the immortality of the soul. And then I go back to uh, early Greek philosophy uh, to discuss the teaching on the, the immortality of the soul by Plato and uh, before him by Pythagoras and later by the uh, Neoplatonists and also their reasons why they believe the soul to be uh, immortal. Uh, and I discuss uh, uh, the concept of transmigration, um, which some people call reincarnation, but... Um, it's not actually a, a precise rendering of how it used to be understood in the, among the early Indo-Europeans. Uh, it, it was a more nuanced uh, version than the one which is taught nowadays, for example, by the theosophists and the, uh, the Hare Krishna movement and so on. Um, and then in the final section uh, of, the, of the chapter, I touch upon what I call relative immortality through creativity. And then I take the examples of Homer and Nietzsche and um, also Mahler and Kafka, as people who created uh, works which have uh, outlasted them. In the case of Homer, it's outlasted him by uh, almost uh, three millenniums. Uh, yeah. In the case of Nietzsche, uh, who was, of course, an, an atheist, so we couldn't even consider the, the immortality of the soul. But he consciously strove to obtain a measure of eternal life through his works. Uh, for example, in the, one of his late works, he says... Um, uh, to create things on which time I tried teeth in vain. Uh, that, is, that was his aim. And in uh, one of his uh, uh, ultimate, uh, I think his penultimate work, only the day after tomorrow belongs to me. Some are born posthumously. Uh, and the same applies, of course, to uh, the great Danish philosopher Kierkegaard, uh, who lived just before Nietzsche. And in both cases, they only achieved their fame uh, uh, posthumously. Uh, yeah from the early 20th century. And the same applies to Gustav Mahler, who is one of my favorite composers, um, who in his lifetime was better known as a conductor at the Vienna Court Opera. And he uh, famously declared, uh, meine Zeit wird noch kommen, my time will yet come. And again, his contemporary uh, Franz Kafka, the great novelist, um, who only became famous after his death when his friend Max Broad uh, published his books. And uh, then I just mentioned in the final uh, uh, sentence that an interesting coincidence is that both Mahler and Kafka were Bohemian born German speaking Jewish intellectuals. Their time has certainly come to the benefit of civilized persons worldwide. <laughs> so, a little a tribute I'm paying to some of those uh, great creators there. Um, I have a, um, I so, I have a, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Please send in your bed. No, no, sorry, Richard. Uh, yes. Oh, I, I, I just, you know, I know it's a, a sad thing, but I just wonder. I wonder if you have a very lonely existence because I don't know who would want to talk to you about a lot of these things. Sometimes <laughs> I feel like, well, the, the things you're interested in just seem to be rare. I don't know if you have, uh, if it's difficult for you to find other people that can and will and want to engage on some of these issues. Like, but, you know, I know it's a strange thing to ask, but you know, the uh, people around yeah. you, the people you know, what's your, what are your thoughts there? Yes. Uh, um, oh, no, you are, you are quite correct. Uh, actually, um, uh, I know very few people that I can discuss these things with. There are perhaps three, three or four friends in South Africa with whom I'm in contact uh, from time to time. Um, there's perhaps one or two here in Britain, uh, one or two in America. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, one in Greece, that's about it. So it's certainly less than, than uh, 10 in total. Um, and uh, so it's certainly, uh, most of the time, it's my own uh, thinking, my own thoughts, and I do talk to myself a lot, uh, so perhaps that's a kind of uh, of, of a dialogue. Uh, not as interesting as talking to someone else, but it's better than nothing. Well, you can go back in time, and I guess, and find comfort that others have thought, you know, these thoughts through thousands of years, which is great, you know. But uh, 
in the modern sense, it's it's much harder to find that stuff. I know, like, uh, for instance, Ryan Holiday has taken up the banner of Stoicism, and you know he talks about it quite frequently. The thinkers mm-hmm. like Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius, but um, you know it's, it's rare. It seems very mm-hmm. rare, and uh, especially what you've been thinking about and researching. What um, I don't know how you'd put it into words, but uh, it seems like you have a good command of various philosophers and you know major lines of thought through thousands of years how has this changed your perception of the world and your relationships and you know your everyday existence like any anything you can put into words that uh, has changed in your worldview in the past few years um you know certainly uh, shifted some priorities in my life um undoubtedly um things that that many other people take very seriously like say uh, uh you know politics and elections and uh, debates and all these things um i see them as as passing and and ephemeral you know and uh at the end of the day uh, do, do they really change that much you know uh, in as far as our lives are concerned whether it's this party ruling or that party ruling or this politician or that politician um of course some some ideologies have had huge influences over societies one only has to think of the 20th century you know with some of the radical ideologies uh, whether they were far left or far right or even in the middle, you know, and the things that they that they have done. Um, so I think um, uh, the, reading philosophy, reading uh, philosophy and um, theology, uh, metaphysics very much um, has helped me to to uh, not take those things too seriously or as much as I used to in my young days. Uh, my first degree was in political studies, so I thought that politics was something uh, very grand, <laughs> very special. Um, now, of course, it affects all of us, uh, the decisions made by the powers that be. But I don't think it's really worth breaking our heads over and especially not uh, getting uh, angry, you know, at, at, towards other people having conflicts and uh, endless debates and emotions being whipped up and so on. It's, it's simply not worth it. There are far more interesting things in life. And um, I absolutely believe that I have to continue doing this. So I'm hard at work now on the next book. Um, which is provisionally titled Origins, and in which I, um, again, uh, restate certain positions coming from traditional philosophies and religions. Uh, and in the process, I want to uh, take issue with some of the, the dominant views on certain kinds of origins, as found, for example, in the academic world, whether it's cosmic origins or human origins or cultural origins. I believe that there's a lot of um, uh, vested interests in the academic world. Uh, it is certainly not the uh, disinterested, objective, neutral uh, uh, sphere, which I think is how, uh, the, how most people view the academic world. Um, they also have their vested interests uh, that they serve. Um, and of course, there's the famous argument by Thomas Kuhn um, in the, around half a century ago uh, about uh, knowledge um, ex- being expressed in the form of paradigms. And the same applies to scientific knowledge and any other kind of academic knowledge. It doesn't accrue gradually, uh, which I think is how most people think, and also because it fits in with a Darwinian model of gradual incremental changes in evolution, uh, which uh, many people contest. Instead, uh, uh, knowledge, including scientific knowledge, uh, moves by means of paradigms. And each time a paradigm became become, uh, um, established, it's very difficult to change that. Uh, so at the moment, neo-Darwinism is the ruling paradigm in the biological sciences. Um, to some extent, um, one could say a combination of relativity and quantum theory in the in the physical sciences. Uh, but before that, for a long time, it was uh, the uh, Copernican model and the Newtonian model, and it was difficult. It was really problematic to uh, to change those. And uh, the current ones, of course, are also deficient in certain uh, aspects. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with a, a metaphysical and physical scientist with the name of Wolfgang Smith in California. Uh, Wolfgang Smith, no. Yes, it's certainly someone I would recommend if you can, uh, you know, ever, uh, if you, you know, wish to approach him for an interview. Um, the some of his supporters have recently founded a, a project called um, Philos Sophia, from harking back to the, the Greek words. It's actually philia, uh, which means loving friendship, and sophia, which means uh, wisdom. It's the origin of the word philosophy, which therefore means uh, love of wisdom in the technical, strict technical meaning, which is also how the the classical Greeks understood it. 
uh, philosophy was not for them. Uh, armchair philosophizing or speculating about things naively. Uh, it, is, it was a deadly serious uh, affair. And it was also related to, to, at the end of the day, to our salvation. It was intimately connected with um, classical philosophy, uh, not only among the Greek, but also among the, the, the ancient um, Indians and Chinese, of course, um, what people call Hinduism and, and Taoism. So uh, Wokong has been doing ex extremely important work on the interaction okay. be between uh, physical science on the one hand, because that's what he was trained in. Uh, he was a mathematician for decades, a professor of mathematics at um, prestigious institutes like MIT and UCLA. Um, but since his retirement uh, from that uh, in the 80s, he's been focusing on the metaphysical side and its interaction with, with physics, uh, quantum physics being one of his uh, specialities. So uh, he's, over the past couple of years, he's written a number of extraordinary books again, um, in which it, it, it becomes clear that entirely new paradigms are needed for the physical sciences as well, no, not, not only in biology um, and, and elsewhere, but also in the physical sciences, where I think many people thought that with, with quantum theory and the, specula the ongoing speculation about the string theory and the grand unified theory and so on, we basically come to, so? to, to as far as we can go with, with knowledge of the physical world. Uh, but it seems well, that... I've, uh, yeah, I've, I've interviewed, I mean, well over 2,000 people, but I've interviewed, I, I would say probably, I don't know, at least 700 um, scientists, clinicians, mm -hmm. and, you know, when I bring up anything metaphysical, they go, uh, uh, we won't go there. You know, everyone's, mm -hmm. no one wants to talk about it, and they'll either laugh at it, um, or they'll not want to comment on it, and I know part of it's because it may jeopardize their funding, they may look bad mm -hmm. peers and be attacked, and it's very sad, but that's what I see in the aggregate when I speak to a lot of people. There's there's the people that will not say much about it, but they do have their beliefs. And then the people that don't believe in anything and they'll just laugh at, mm -hmm. at people that do believe in things and ridicule them. Yes, I feel I feel sorry for them, actually, Richard, uh, because the, the people who ridicule uh, um, the reality of metaphysics and uh, reject it altogether, which, of course, is the fashionable thing in the in the modern world and especially in the academic world. Uh, because they're missing out on a great deal of, of uh, intellectual satisfaction. Um, and if I use the word intellectual uh, uh, in brackets you know, almost or in, uh, uh, in a conditional sense, because most people also confuse the intellectual with the rational. And in the traditional understanding, these are two different things. The rational is what uh, we use all the time for everyday thinking. Um, so two plus two equals four. And, you know, if this happens, that will happen. And it's very important. We can't live without it. We can't survive without rational thinking. But all of the metaphysical and spiritual traditions agree that above the rational level is an intellectual level. In Greek, the word for that is nous, N-O-U-S, which is translated as mind or intellect. And it is uh, taught by all of the great spiritual teachers that we can attune our uh, uh, individual reason to this, to that huge universal mind or intellect. And for, for example, when I listen to uh, certain kinds of music, uh, what mostly classical music um, from the uh, Renaissance until some of the 20th century composers even, um, it's, it's as if I can access that world, that higher world. Uh, it becomes clear. Uh, and I don't think I'm being conceited or anything. Many other people have also uh, experienced music in that way. So uh, it, it's absolutely... Uh, um, like I said, I can only feel sorry for those who deny the reality of that of that higher metaphysical world or worlds even. Yeah, true. So, um, why not? We're we're running out of time for this session. What? I mean, it, uh, it's it's like you're at the uh, the doorway to an entire new world of of thought and study that people would have to engage in. What's the first few steps for people that are listening that are interested? Um, you know, where, what are the titles of one or more of your books that they may want to look at and how would they uh, find out more and get in touch? Well, the only books I've published so far are the one, uh, the first one which appeared last year, uh, From Logos to Bios, uh, on, uh, which you already kindly uh, uh, had an interview with me early in the year, which deals with Greek philosophy and evolutionary theory, um, in which I um, suggest alternative theories of evolution such as directed evolution and um, evolution according to natural law um, to uh, replace the current model of neo-Darwinism. And uh, in this second book, which appeared a few months ago, uh, titled Reality from Metaphysics to Metapolitics, um, quite a number of my articles have been published also. And um, 
in various journals and elsewhere. And most of them I have placed on my academia site. Um, so uh, would that be uh, would that be a place I could recommend uh, if someone wanted to read more of it? Yeah, that's fine. What's the uh, the URL of the site, or what's an easy way for people to Google and find you? Uh, let me you see. have an unusual name, which is good. Wine and the beer. <laughs> yeah. uh, in Google, you come up pretty quick, which is good. That's right. You sure you don't have any cousins in the De Beers family, right? In, in South uh, no, I'm a, no, I'm afraid I'm from the poor side of the family. <laughs> Shame. Shame. <laughs> Many people have asked me that. Um, yes, the, the URL for that is uh, independent researcher. Independent researcher, okay. Dot academia hmm. dot edu forward okay. slash. And then after the slash, it's my orthodox name, which is Vladimir de Beer. So all of hmm. that is one, one word, Vladimir de Beer. Okay, and I'll make sure in the show notes that we have that. So it'll be uh, written and verbal. So, okay. okay. Well, very good. Well, well Wynan, uh, I'm always glad to talk to you. I appreciate it. You're a, a voice from uh, you know a place that, uh, like I said, few people will talk about at all. So, so thank you for coming. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Richard. It's kind of you. And all the best for the future. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.